I've been working and living as a park ranger for almost five years now. Stationed at a fairly remote outpost in the middle of the good old-fashioned American wilderness. For reasons I'd rather not get into, I can't disclose my exact location, but what I will say is that my workplace is effectively a lone watchtower surrounded by miles upon miles of forests and lakes. There's a bunch of these towers scattered around the county, though the nearest one to me is at least a day's hike away and barely a dot on the horizon. Des Rangers, our official designation is to keep troublemakers out of our woods, but that isn't why we're here. Our job is to keep things in. A little about me. I'm 27 years old and lived off the land for as long as I can remember. My old man was a hunter, and for most of my life I worked on our little ranch and helped my father track rabbits and deer. I went to school, too. I'm not a complete hick. But college wasn't for me, and I fell into a bunch of odd labor jobs. It was by pure chance I got this job. They were looking for someone who knew the lay of the land, to fill in a suddenly vacant position, and I guess they figured I was right for the job. I'll be blunt. The woods can be a very dangerous place. In all the time I've worked here, I've had to bury ten unlucky visitors. That might seem a lot to you, but trust me when I say that 10 is not bad going by this park standard. My more experienced colleagues in the northern regions have it a lot worse. Or so I'm told at the B weekly meetings we have at the center camp. Still, to me it's 10 people too many, and despite my best efforts to ward people away from the more unsafe areas of woodland, sometimes it feels like these people are trying to get themselves killed. My day, today routine isn't all that interesting, so I'll spare you that. I will say that I live on site, so although I have officially contracted hours and tasks that have to be completed, I'm technically at work 24-7. Once or twice a month, I'll take a drive into the town, and of course there's the aforementioned meetings every fortnight, but most of the time I'm completely isolated. I won't lie, it gets lonely out here, which is part of why I'm writing this journal. I guess it's nice to imagine someone reading it and being a part of my story. Enough sentiment. There have been some goings. On as of late that, to be frank, worry me. Reports of missing people are cropping up all over the park. Trevor, the guy manning the nearest station to me, once told me over the radio that he found the remains of one unlucky bastard halfway up a tree like a panada. It's getting hard to cover up, apparently, and there's talk of us having to buddy up on patrol shifts. Nobody knows if the incidents are connected, but by the sounds of things, it might have something to do with the summer rush. You see, around this time of year, we get almost triple the amount of visitors. During the hot summer months, we get all manner of tourists, party-goers, and more piling in from F knows. Where? These types of people are the worst. Most of them are harmless enough, but just don't understand the concept of simple rules like stay in your tent between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. and don't wander into the woods by yourself. The first incident that I recall happened some three weeks back. I was overlooking the woods one evening, watching the sun begin its descent behind the distant mountain ranges and enjoying a smoke, when I hear the distinct sound of two gunshots ringing out in the distance. I cursed my luck. From the sounds of it, whoever it was had fired a rifle of some kind, most likely semi-automatic. Hunting is absolutely forbidden in our park, something we enforced strictly. I was just about to head inside and radio for backup. Trust me when I say you don't want to approach one or more gun, toting likely inebriated rednecks by yourself. When I heard another sound, a rising high-pitched scream of terror, followed by a guttural unearthly howl that set the hairs on, the back of my neck upright. Animals, particularly nocturnal ones, can make some pretty messed up sounds, but nothing I knew of could make that sort of noise. 
It sounded warped and unnatural, yet there was something undeniably lifelike that left me second guessing. I slung my rifle over my shoulder, grabbed a flashlight, and took off down the stairs in search of the source. I had a good sense of where it was coming from, and based on the gunshots I could tell I was within fifteen minutes. I only prayed I would be able to get there on time as I hauled ass along the trail. As I ran, several more shots rang out, the sound of which served as my guide. I could hear distant shouting sounded like two people at least, as well as more of those godforsaken sounds. My heart was pounding out of my chest, and I gripped my flashlight with white knuckles as I drew closer and closer. In the distance, I could make out the remains of what had been a campsite. The fire still smoldered, surrounded by scattered belongings. There was a tent, which was mostly intact, albeit crumpling in on one side, from where the supports had been knocked out by something. I found the first body there, a male in his mid-twenties, if I had to guess. His abdomen had been completely shredded, deep claw marks raked across his bare chest and stomach, and his guts scattered around him. His face was contorted, a permanent expression of terror spread across his countenance. The grass around him was almost black with his blood. I've seen and heard a lot in my time, but the sight and smell of his ruined body was enough to send me stumbling away, dry heaving. He hadn't gone easy. Another gunshot snapped me out of it. They were close, and I could actually make out the muzzle flash further down the trail. Another scream of terror, then one of pain. Then another gunshot. I could see from here what was happening, moving quickly to try and intervene, expecting to see a mama grizzly at the worst. I wasn't prepared for what I saw next. In the clearing ahead, there was something hunched over. It was big, at least seven or eight feet and its body was twisted and distorted, covered in patchy gray fur, flecked with crimson blood. From behind, I couldn't make out exactly what it looked like, but could see that it had somebody pinned, another man. A few feet ahead, another, fatter guy was cowering, trying to reload his rifle with shaking hands. The man on the ground thrashed around, letting out pained wails that dug into my ears, the hollering of someone who knows that they're about to die. It's not a sound anybody should have to hear. Whatever monster it was on top of him, it was devouring him. I saw it throw its head back, blood spraying indiscriminately, teeth tearing into the man's flesh. He weakly tried to break free, thudding his arms against its thick hide, but it either couldn't feel him or didn't care. It growled and snapped at its frantic prey, whose struggling grew weaker and weaker before ceasing entirely. It was then that I noticed how goddamn quiet it was out there. Not a sound, no wind, no trees rustling, just the whimpering of the fat man and the snapping and gurgling as the monster ate its fill. I crouched in the foliage a few dozen meters away, gun raised and flashlight at the ready. I wanted to help, but throwing myself at whatever the F this thing was would unalive myself. I think it was at about that point when I caught the fat man's gaze. His face pale, he frantically gestured for help. I shook my head, hushing him with a finger over pursed lips, then gestured for him to move towards me. Slow, I mouthed, hoping he would understand. He began shuffling towards me, circling the clearing. The monster didn't seem to acknowledge him, seemingly contented with its feast. I stayed put as he made painfully slow progress every second seeming to stretch out for much longer. He was maybe ten meters from me when something began to move in the woods behind him, and something else crashed through the tree line. The fat man turned around and screamed, a shrill, piercing cry that still sticks with me even all this time later. A second creature had emerged from the forest. It happened in a blur. I barely caught a glance of the thing as it hurtled itself towards the fat man. This one was a little smaller, its body distorted and twisted, moving on all four limbs as its cruel maw snapped open. Patches of fur covered its pale body, and a maw filled with needles that glinted in the moonlight honed in on its terrified victim. He threw up the gun, still empty of course, and barely got out a yelp before he was pinned to the ground. I damn near fainted watching it hunt over him and eat him alive. 
He screamed and gurgled as it got a grip on his leg and started dragging him, still conscious, back into the forest, leaving a blood trail in its wake. I could only watch, helpless and more frightened than I have been in my 27 years, as the slaughter unfolded before me. I tried to move backwards, causing a branch to snap underfoot. I cursed silently as the first creature looked up instantly, its head snapping violently towards me, two piercing white eyes glinting in the darkness. Drool and gore hung from its mouth in blood strings as it wheezed softly, scanning the tree line for a moment before turning back to its meal. It was near dawn when I finally found the courage to move. Both creatures had long since left the former dragging what little remained of its quarry to have knows where. On first light, I slowly got to my feet and made my way back to my tower, and that's where it ended. I told my superiors what happened, and they assured me they would look into it. Clean up. Contact families. Formalities to them. It's been three weeks since, and things don't feel the same. In fact, I think that night was just the beginning. I haven't encountered those things, but I can't step outside past sundown without a chill going down my back. I've heard things from my colleagues, whispers really, about similar incidents happening across the park. We have another meeting tomorrow. I'm going to try and get to the bottom of this. Stay tuned. It's already been two weeks since I've got a job as a park ranger. It was an isolated area meant to preserve possible near. Extinction species, as they have no more than a dozens left alive. I remember that when I first applied, they made sure I went through enough training to prepare both physically and mentally. It was a very tough job, according to my supervisor, and would possibly include killing poachers if necessary. Of course I wasn't sure if it was acceptable to do that instead of arresting them, but the site was pretty much far away from any possible city, so I didn't complain and went along. Everything seemed normal at the first days on my shifts. The same patrol around and make sure everything is being preserved and protected for poachers. You know, the usual park ranger duties that is until the eleventh day when I was called to do the night shift as the guard assigned to it got into it terrible accident on the way home and broke his lee. Being someone who took the job seriously, I agreed to it and stayed for the night shift, but before I could start, my supervisor went to me and explained what to do, since it was different from my usual daytime shifts, since it's your first time in this position. I can assume you're not used to this role, right? He asked me as I geared up with the night shift tools. Yes, sir, I'm not used to work until late let alone on the dead of the night, but I've got confidence that I can do it until the other guy recovers. I answered, being a little nervous, but keeping my stance. He pulled me aside before I was about to start and explained me what I had to do and what to expect in certain situations. All right, so here are the basics. If you hear bone cracking sounds, ignore them. If you hear metal rustling, turn off your flashlight. And if you hear voices calling for you that aren't coming from your radio, Shoot your gun to scare them away. Do I need to repeat anything? He asked in a serious way. No, sir, I understood everything. If you want, I can even get a note if I forget. I answered a bit nervous after his explanation. Good, I'll be reaching you to time from time to check. And as he said that, he walked away. Now alone and fully geared, I started to patrol. I was supposed to head to the north zone of the site and make sure everything is in order. The moon was shining bright, and everything was quiet and eerie. Not even owls could be heard. Everything was dead silent, save for my footsteps and the voice on the radio from my supervisor. As I was already midway on the path, I started to hear the metal rustling nearby, so as instructed, I turned off my flashlight and waited. It was obviously too dark to see, but I could make a silhouette that somewhat resembled a wolf with something on its back but it quickly ran off, and I turned on my flashlight again to keep moving. I was approaching the location. I heard the same voices I was told about my supervisor, who also could hear it from his radio, instructed me to fire my gun, but as I was about to do it, I realized I didn't load any bullet. 
and I noticed the voices getting closer, but they started to fade away on the darkness. It was tempting, so despite my supervisor telling me to proceed, I went off the path and followed the voices. That's when I found the source. It looked vaguely human, but its skin was so melted that it looked like clay. It was hard to hear, but I could make some words. It was trying to scream, Help, please itch. Help, I beg you, it hopelessly tried to say. I just stood there frozen, and when I turned my flashlight up, I noticed the wolf thing. It was huge, five foot five in height, if I had to guess. It had metal tendrils coming out of its it back, and it just stared as it pulled the melted body humanoid as it continued to beg for help. Without any choice, I ran back to the path and kept going until I reached my destiny and found my supervisor waiting for me. He pulled me inside the radio building and quickly shut the door. So what did you find on the way? He asked while panting from shutting the door. What do you mean? I could die because of that thing. Was it always here on the site? I yelled while trying to get answers. He just shut me off and explained everything to me. This place had more dangerous species that were largely hunted across the globe, so they were brought here to be kept. I was still confused about the situation. Why would they want them alive? Are they really that important? The next days in the night shift were much more quieter, but from time to time I would see the wolf thing or another weird animal that I couldn't make the details. I'm not sure what this place really is or what are all the things living within the area, but I know one thing. Those monsters were better off contained. Years ago, when my wife and I were dating, we talked about Bigfoot. I told her a story about my mother and father back in 1967. They were out by Spangenberg Lake in Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania, about 10 miles from where we lived. They told me that they had gotten his car about 4 a.m. and out of the woods came a huge white fur-covered beast on two feet. It stood way over the car. I asked my dad what its face looked like and he said he didn't know because he just hit the gas and got out of there. As I'm telling my wife this, I searched White Bigfoot on Google. Amazingly enough, a video pops up showing this white Bigfoot in Carbondale, Pennsylvania, which is one town over from us. The wooded sections behind Carbondale go all the way to Spangenberg Lake. I have no doubt it's real. This incident occurred in the town of Grays Creek, North Carolina. My brother Larry is working as a delivery man for the local branch of a nationwide pizza chain. He was tasked to deliver some pizzas to a college frat house. Larry's car was in the shop at the time, so he was driving his boss's pickup truck. He successfully delivered the pizzas and was driving back through Grays Creek on a road with overhanging oak trees. He had the windows open and was listening to the radio when all of a sudden he heard a loud bang from the bed of the truck. He slammed on the brakes while looking in the rearview mirror and could see something black up against the rear window. When he got to a full stop, he saw something flailing around and it managed to roll and push its way to the open tailgate to get out of the truck bed. Larry was still looking in the rearview mirror trying to figure out what this thing was when he saw it stand on two feet and rise to an estimated height of seven feet. He grabbed and tilted the mirror so he could see its face, and right as he got it in focus, it looked right into the mirror back at him with an expression of pure murderous hate on its human-like face. It then let out a huge and super loud screeching roar. Larry ain't no dummy. He turned right back around and stomped on the gas because he knew if this thing got its hand on him, it would absolutely tear him apart. Larry says he has no recollection of driving back to the pizza joint. Just that the next thing he knew, he was getting out of the truck and his knees buckled. He would have fallen out flat had he not managed to catch himself in the door's armrest. He said that he stayed squatted and was gulping air for about three minutes. Then he went into the pizza place trying to look like he was all right. The rest of the story comes from my mother. When Larry's boss saw him, he knew Larry was definitely not all right because he was as pale as a sheet.
and his eyes were huge. Larry's manager turned him right back around and drove him home. Larry says he has no memory of saying anything to his boss during the drive. Mom walked Larry back to his room so he could lie down while my dad and Larry's boss looked at his truck. The part of the bed sides near the window was crumpled downwards a good bit, and there was blood in the bed as well. There were also some tufts of hair, and there was a really bad smell. Dad said it smelled like a skunk had sprayed down a burning tire while King Kong crept on it. Mom and Dad wound up sitting up with Larry all night because he was obviously in a state of shock, and they came close to taking him to the hospital a couple times. But Larry insisted he was okay. He related his story to both Mom and Dad a little while afterward. They say they both believed him, and my parents have always been experts at spotting lies. Trust me on that one. About a year later, Mom, Dad, my wife, and I, along with Larry and his family, were vacationing together, and I was excited that I'd get to ask him about his experience face to face. I sat down with a notepad and pen and downloaded a voice recorder app on my phone. He looked both and just said, no way. I don't want you submitting this to any Bigfoot organization. Furthermore, he said that this was going to be the last time we talked about this. I agreed and asked some questions that helped fill in the blanks in the account. I just shared it with you. I saw both the fear in his eyes and goosebumps rise up on his arms more than once. You can't fake that and it really hits home for me. My brother is former special forces and served a tour over in the sandbox. A rake. He just doesn't get scared. The anticipation was palpable as I finalized the purchase of my new hunting property deep in the rugged Texas wilderness. The land was untamed, teeming with game, and a thrill for any hunter like me. Little did I know that this new acquisition would lead to a horrifying encounter that would haunt me for the rest of my days. I quickly set up trail cameras throughout the dense forest, eager to get a sense of the wildlife on my new land. The first few weeks were uneventful, capturing images of deer, raccoons, and the occasional bear. But one crisp autumn morning, as I checked the latest trail camera photos, my excitement turned to unease. There, amidst the ordinary animal captures, was a picture that sent chills down my spine. It was a dark, massive figure, covered in fur, with a human-like face, staring with its gray, dead eyes, directly into the camera. It was unmistakable, a Sasquatch, the legendary creature that had been whispered about in hushed tones by hunters and locals for generations. My heart pounded as I examined the photo over and over. Surely it was some weirdo in a costume, perhaps an inbred black bear. I kept making excuses as to what it was in order to comfort myself. I knew the consequences of sharing this with anyone. I'd be ridiculed, deemed a madman. Obviously, no one would believe me. So naturally, the need to prove what I had seen gnawed at me. Determined to find answers, I decided to venture into the woods with my loyal hunting dog, Max, by my side. The day was overcast, the forest eerily silent, as Max and I hiked deeper into the woods. The anticipation weighed heavily on me. As excited as I may have been, uh, I was terrified. Deep down, though, I figured I probably wouldn't even encounter it. Hours passed, and the sun began its descent. Just as I had given up hope, we heard it. A low, guttural growl resonating through the trees. My hand instinctively went to the rifle slung over my shoulder. I signaled for Max to stay close, but the faithful dog growled, his hackles raised. Suddenly it emerged from the shadows. That familiar, massive, dark figure covered in matted black fur with piercing eyes that held a deep primal intelligence. It was said Sasquatch, and it had found us. Fear gripped me hard, and my heart raced as I raised my rifle, not intending to harm the creature, but only to ward it off. The Sasquatch, with a speed that defied its size, lunged forward, its massive arms closing around Max. My loyal dog let out a heart-wrenching yelp as the creature's grip tightened. 
I fired my rifle, but missed completely as the beast flew about the thick woods, carrying my buddy, Max, in its filthy grip. The world seemed to slow down, and I watched in abject horror as Max was being torn apart by the monstrous beast. The Sasquatch's eyes bore into mine, an intelligence in them that sent a shiver down my spine. With Max's lifeless body cradled in its arms, the Sasquatch turned and vanished back into the forest, leaving behind a shaken and anguished hunter. I was left in the darkening woods, the weight of guilt and grief pressing down on me. I wanted to cry, but yet I was emotionless. I'd sought proof, but the cost was higher than I could have ever imagined. As I made my way back to my cabin, the forests once... Familiar beauty now held a sinister aura. The Sasquatch was no longer a legend. It was a brutal reality that had torn my world apart, and I would forever be haunted by the memory of that fateful encounter. The chilling scream of the Sasquatch echoed in my ears, a reminder that the line between myth and reality had blurred, and the forest held secrets more terrifying than I had ever imagined. I've encountered bears, snakes, moose, and recently a bobcat, but I never felt terror like I did when I was a kid. I was at a beach in Juneau with my parents and sister when I was very young. It was a nice day, the river was blue, and so was the sky for once. A bunch of families with small children and babies were out just barbking. We were walking along the beach toward the picnic area, and I heard a baby crying in the woods. I learned about Kushtakaya and Wendigo and other stories about things mimicking people at school, but at the time it didn't cross my mind that it was odd. Nobody else was concerned about this crying child. So my stupid ass lets my family walk ahead and I go into the woods. I didn't get very far when I centered in on the sound. I could still see the beach from the trees. I didn't see a baby or kid on the ground anywhere but I heard the sound again and looked up at a tree. It was a goddamn raven sitting there making baby noises. A different raven swooped at me from the side and knocked my hat off, and I took off running back to my parents. Later, the only thing I could think of as to why they did that was my hat was neon pink with sparkly sequins on it, and they wanted the sequins. Scared the shit out to me then, and still creeps me out to think about it. I'd like to tell you about the encounter my son had, maybe four years ago. He told me about it then, but I had no clue. Now we have dogman encounters, and now I know. Here's what happened. My son's friend was driving him home, about 11 p.m., through a rural residential area. The houses are spaced some distance apart. They were on a two-lane highway with no street lights and very little traffic. The area is not overly wooded but his patches of trees and fields. This area would probably be included in foothills of the Smoky Mountains. Anyway, they were driving along when suddenly, from the right side of the road, this thing sprang out and was across the road and into the bushes on the other side in two leaps or bounds or steps or however you want to say it. It was in full view because of their headlights. My son said the first thing he thought was dog. He went on to say that it was running on all fours like a deer. He said it was a color of a deer with a huge dog head, massive shoulders, and a really small waist. He kept repeating how big it was, so I asked for a comparison. I asked if he meant huge like maybe a big deer or was it maybe as tall as a cow. He answered, and I can quote his answer, Mom, this thing was massive. If we had hit it, the car would have gone underneath it, and its body would have hit the windshield. I don't remember what kind of car it was, but it was about the size and shape of one of those older Sentras. He said that neither he or his friend said anything for about ten seconds, and then his friend yelled, Did you see that? My son said yes, and they didn't say another word the rest of the way. And that's it. It's really creepy to me, and I thought other listeners like Mike to hear about it.
This happened in late August of 97 in a side valley of Goldstream Valley, a relatively populated area just north of Fairbanks. Although it's quite close to the Fairbanks area with many houses and roads and the main part of Goldstream, the side valleys are still as wild as they were a thousand years ago. I was hunting roughed grouse in one of these side valleys, and I prefer not to disclose which one. I was on a south-facing aspen, covered hillside, and had been hunting all afternoon and evening, intending to spend the night out on the hill and hunt my way back in the morning. As I was making camp, a black bear almost walked right into me. I heard him coming from a distance and scared him away before he got closer. Later on, it will become apparent why I mentioned this. So I was sleeping out in the open without a tent under a spruce tree. Sometime in the middle of the night, I was awakened by something crawling around my camp, maybe 30 feet or so away from me, walking in the circle I mentioned earlier. The bear I mentioned before wasn't the source of these sounds. My father is a hunting guide, and I literally grew up hunting bears, so I know what a bear sounds like when it's walking. Whatever this thing was, it was walking on two legs with a bit of a shuffling sound between each step, as if it was dragging its feet just a bit. The leaves on the forest floor were dried like potato chips, and it was breaking a lot of branches. I could hear it and follow its movements quite distinctly. I have to say that I've spent a lot of time here in the Alaskan bush and have never before or, or since been truly afraid of anything I've encountered. But I don't mind saying that on that particular night, I was literally shaking with fear. It, or whatever it was, circled my camp for what seemed like hours, but it was probably only five or so minutes. Finally, remembering something I once read about Indian beliefs regarding woodsmen, I started talking to it, albeit in a shaky voice, saying I wanted no trouble that night. The thing stopped dead in its tracks, and then a few moments later I heard it trotting downhill away from me. Talking to such a creature may sound kind of cornball, but all I know is that it works. I've kicked myself for this many times since, but the next morning I didn't bother to look for any tracks, hair, or evidence. I just packed up and resumed my hunting. I had no further trouble with the woodsman. As a final couple of notes, I do recall hearing a kind of low muttering sound as it was prowling around. Also, having since done some reading on Bigfoot sightings, I've noticed that a lot of people reported the animal having a strong, foul odor. However, I did not smell any particular odor, foul or otherwise. Most of the native peoples of Alaska seem to have stories about the woodsman, the bushman, or even the hairy man. Other than this, I've never heard of anyone I know having an actual encounter with a woodsman in Alaska. This incident occurred in June 2019 while I was still living in Nashville, Tennessee. My school had let out and I was staying at a friend which between friends and me, I'd drop off my stuff and then wander the neighborhood late at night because I couldn't sleep. Now don't get me wrong, I've had plenty of strange things happen to me on my night walks. From the homeless offering me a duck to being followed by a car of drunk guys, but this one was different. One night I saw two figures come out of the woods. They looked smaller and younger than me, and I was instantly curious. I followed the kids, staying quiet, when suddenly the little girl, she seemed to be younger than the boy, stood in the middle of the road. Of course I bolt out and tackle her as a car comes, the thing nearly missing both of us. When I looked down, the little girl was more annoyed than happy or grateful. What got my attention was the black eyes. It was like starting into a void. I couldn't look away as soon as I looked into them. I felt a rush of fear so strong that it overwhelmed everything. I still don't know how long that it lasted, or if anything happened, but the next thing I knew, the boy was ripping me off the girl with surprising strength. By now, I was completely freaked. I couldn't bring myself to check his eyes. Doing what I felt best, I literally slipped his grip and took off sprinting. I could hear them running after me, yelling for me to wait, to stop, and I don't know why, but I almost did. I ended up sprinting through backyards until I couldn't hear them before going to my friends. 
She's the one that told me of black-eyed kids. I'm not crazy. I know it really happened. I was rabbit hunting between the hours of 20, 1.30 CDT to about 23.15 CDT on a farm outside of Maud, Oklahoma. It was a clear and cold night with a quarter moon out. I was armed with a pump-action tactical shotgun and a Kimber 5 in 45 cow pistol along with about 100 rounds of 45 and 45 shotgun rounds. Both weapons are equipped with high-end white lights. Upon returning to my home at about 2315 CDT, I walked up on my patio, which is about five feet off the ground. I saw a large human like figure that was bigger than any man I ever saw. I used the surefire white light on my shotgun to see better. Due to light fog, I could only see about 25 feet with the light. The creature was out in the open enough to see an outline of the figure. I had seen all my animals act unusual prior, a feeling of being watched at hours of darkness more than once. The figure was watching me and made eye contact. It was very large and close to seven to eight feet tall, was a very stocky build, would guess over 400 pounds. The figure seemed annoyed that I pointed my shotgun at it. It seemed to have no fear of me or my animals. My dog, military craned, cowered down and would not respond to commands. I did contact a Bigfoot team that showed up within 72 hours of this. No evidence was found. No footprints, hair, nothing. I did experience some lapses in memory thereafter. I'm a retired Special Forces sniper with 10 years of experience and three tours in Iraq, including the Iraq invasion with the 3rd M. Div on the front lines. I have no knowledge after all I have seen and done to describe this figure. I do need to be kept out of any public report because of my background and security clearance with the military. I just want answers and will provide full cooperation in person. The biggest thing that bothers me is the lack of fear from the figure and my fear back. I fear very little in life. Just want to get to the bottom of this. Something that I wouldn't believe unless I saw it just stepped up about 30 feet in front of me, stared at me, and kind of grunted before walking into the woods very quietly. I did have a rifle and a handgun on me because I was out hunting, but for some reason I did not feel threatened. However, I did turn around and head back to my car, often glancing over my shoulder. On several occasions I heard cracking branches and a few low to high tones coming from the direction that the really tall, at least six feet shaggy, dark brown thing had gone. It made me want to walk a little faster. Some of those sounds were answered from the other side of the road, but other than that, no further sightings or hearing took place over the years. I should mention that this also occurred back in 1964, and I have not been able to put it out of my mind. It happened on small dirt road about 30, five miles south of Fairbanks. This dirt road was directly off the Richardson Highway heading south. You take a left off the highway, and this road led to an old area near a small pond, which was about two miles in. Hell hit or sonic bark. I haphazardly called out to one of these things, saying, Go Ju Ra, near Salt Creek in Elk Grove, Illinois. In response, I received a harrowing 15-second howl, which was a combination of a whistle and a scream, on July 23, 2016. That same day, a rock struck the roof of my 18-foot work truck. Shortly after that, my neighbor's dog was dismembered and placed in different garbage cans behind my house. A month later, I heard what sounded like a bark, but it appeared to come from at least a mile away. As a kid, I frequently explored the woods around Chicago. I recall seeing two very tall oak trees, roughly 50 to 70 feet in height, tied together at the top. This area was known for being frequented by Satanists.
This is a report from a native who claims to have seen a hairy person, approximately six to seven feet tall, covered in hair. This sighting occurred as he was walking, casually across the dirt road by Skylack Lake. More specifically, it happened on Skylack Lake Road, which is a side road branching off from the main highway and leading into the woods. According to the witness, this creature looked at him and came to a stop in the middle of the road, appearing surprised. Then it swiftly disappeared into the woods. The witness estimated that he was about 300 yards away from it at the time of the encounter. Notably, there was no snow on the ground yet. He mentioned that they observed each other for a brief moment, prompting him to load his single-shot shotgun as a precaution, since he wasn't sure if the creature was friendly or not. However, he decided against reporting the incident to the authorities, believing that nobody would believe his story. The witness seemed very serious when recounting the experience. It's worth noting that the man is a devout Christian, and this event took place probably around late October or early November. The location is in the vicinity of Sterling, Alaska, and is characterized by a dense spruce forest. I've been to the area myself, and it's secluded from the main highway, surrounded by forests, lakes, and mountains. This took place yesterday, which is odd because it's my birthday. I was out scouting a piece of public land in Racine County, Wisconsin, and I had been zigzagging through a swamp looking for deer sign for this upcoming season. I was seeing some tracks and found a few beds, but nothing to get super excited about, and I thought it was strange that I wasn't bumping any deer considering the wind was in my face and I was creeping pretty slow, so I kept pushing further into the swamp to where it turned into pretty dangerous bog. I then paralleled the danger zone until I hit where the swamp made a transition to timber and started following a deer trail that followed the transition. I followed it for about 100 yards looking for rubs telling me a big buck might be coming to and from the swamp. I suddenly felt like a cold creepy feeling and I just kind of shrugged it off and kept going another 20 yards when I felt it again. So I just stopped and looked all around and that's when I saw something blackish gray about six feet tall move very fast from the timber or swamp transition into a patch of super thick brush. And right when I was starting to think what the heck is that, I heard I would guess what would be about 70, five yards or so away farther in like a very, very large dog like growl or bark or roar that literally made me instantly terrified. I pulled my pocket knife out because it's all I had and slowly backed out until I got to the road where I ran like I, I've never ran before until I got to my truck. I wanted to go to the house across the street and ask them if they'd ever seen anything strange around, but I didn't want to seem like a nut job, so I just left. I've been hunting since I was nine, and I'm 27 now, and I know for certain it was no raccoon, no coyote, or anything other animals that we have around, including the rare cougar, which the Dean Jar says doesn't exist around here, but I know good, reliable people who have seen them. And I looked up every cougar call and sound I could find, and nothing comes even remotely close to it. I'm not scared of anything in the woods, but I know we're not supposed to have blackish-gray, six-foot-tall upright animals in Racine County, Wisconsin. I'm pretty well confused about the whole thing, and for the first time in my life, scared of the forest. My dad is a captain of a container ship. I've heard some stories and seen some crazy pictures. He actually knows Captain Phillips because they work for the same company, so I have heard some things about him. Most of the craziest pictures and stories I've heard, though, are just about the waves. They got hit with huge waves that actually destroyed containers on the ship and knocked a bunch into the ocean. The other cool story is my dad and his crew saved some guy who, for some reason, was in the Atlantic on a fishing boat. Someone spotted him from the deck, and his boat was about to get collapsed, so they went down and got him up the ladder. Ooh. 
I saw something bizarre where I'd see. My time to shine. In 1980, I was one of ten Royal Canadian Sea Cadets on board HMCS Quapel 264, a lovely Canadian destroyer escort commissioned in 1962. We were refueling at sea with the EHMCS protector, so both ships are sailing parallel to each other with a fuel line in between. Two or three whales were swimming near the bow of the protector. The bow came out of the water, then back in. I assume one of the whales was coming up as the ship went down. The next wave brought the bow out of the water again. The whale's tail came up too. A spray of dark blood painted the starboard side of the bow. I briefly saw the damaged portion of the tail before the whale disappeared. In an instant, the whale was gone, and the ship dove into the water, erasing any evidence of the last two or three seconds. I was amazed, and I looked around to see if anybody saw what I saw. Another cadet said he thought he saw something on the bow, but wasn't sure what it was. The regular crew members didn't give a flying F. On the same cruise, a pile of neatly folded clothes were found on the rear deck. Apparently, a seaman jumped overboard into the prop wash somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. Girlfriend called it off while we were at sea. I used to commercial fish off the Oregon coast. We would typically be out 80, 150 miles for Albacore tuna. This trip was for halibut, however, so we're using long line gear. Sits on the bottom. Similar to swordfish, if ever seen that go out. Anyways, we pulled gear, and there was like this half-eel, half-ugly, shark-looking thing. I'd never seen anything like it, nor had anyone else on the boat, both of which had been doing this since the 70s. Unfortunately, it was the first day, and we planned to be out for several, so couldn't have kept it on board. Anyways, not the greatest story, just thought I would share. Rogue waves were always the weirdest or scariest things to me. One put us in danger that was 15, 20 foot high. Former United States Navy air crewman here. On New Year's Day, 1993, our crew was the Ready Alert crew. The Ready Alert is exactly what it sounds like. If anything happens and they need to send a plane up to check something out, one plane is ready to launch at any time to do so. We were launched on a search and rescue mission to see if we could locate a sailboat that had been overdue for a few weeks in the North Atlantic. During our flight, the weather was miserable. The sea was nearly white with foam and ice. I personally saw numerous water spouts, and I remember just thinking to myself, those poor bastards. Maybe if we'd have been sent out looking for them soon after they were reported missing. But not now. Not in this. We're not gonna find anything. We spent eight hours searching. We never found anything. What you're about to read is a little weird. Correction. It's a lot weird. But, for whatever reason... I felt it was interesting enough to write down. Keep in mind that there are first-hand stories, second-hand stories, and so on. This is a third-hand story with as little poetic license as necessary. I am confident I have recorded the details with a high degree of accuracy. It may get confusing, but here we go. What I know of this story came from my close friend Doe. I have known Doe for many years. He is a successful businessman and I would never question his integrity. Several months ago, Doe came by my office, and while we visited, he related the details of a conversation he had with one of his longtime customers. To be honest, Doug and I both don't know what to make of this strange conversation with his customer. His story may just be the raving of a schizophrenic, although the credibility of the person who shared their first-hand account with Doe would make a diagnosis of schizophrenia difficult to imagine, that would at least make sense. But it's an interesting story nonetheless. After writing it down, I emailed the story to Doe for verification. He confirmed I had written the account down as accurately as he felt possible. 
With that introduction, here's what Doe told me. I have this customer who sat down with me at my office and posed a very strange question. He asked, Do you believe in the host? I have only known him for a short time, but I do know he was in the United States Marine Corps, and he has enough accolades and credentials that I would not question his integrity. He comes across as extremely reputable, which makes his story both intriguing and bizarre. To protect his identity, and since I do not have his permission to relate this story, I will refer to him as John. I told John that I, of course, do believe some things have been seen flying and at the same time been unidentifiable. What I don't know is what they were, since, of course, they are by their very nature unidentifiable. That is as logical of a statement as I could have made. John appeared to have accepted my answer. He took it as an affirmative, which is to say that I do in fact believe in UFOs. Crossing that bridge, the strange story began to unroll out of John's mouth. The following is the story told by John to my friend Doe. The story John shared revolved around an elderly friend who lived close to him. I will call his elderly friend Tom. One day Tom asked John if, in fact, he believed in UFOs. John answered in the affirmative. Tom proceeded. He said he had something he wanted to show John. But first, before sharing his story, he must take John to a site in Las Vegas. Once the evening had settled in and the sun had long disappeared behind the Red Rock Mountains, the two of them drove to the corner of Tropicana and Decatur Belve. Just a few miles west of the Las Vegas Strip, this site is well known by long-time Vegas residents who live on the west side of the city. The name it is known by is the Pits. Due to its strange and varied dirt mounds, it is favored by dirt bike enthusiasts. And although it is not far from the famous Las Vegas Strip, it remained undeveloped due to several reasons. The first would be the cost of leveling the ground, and the second would be its location, being part of a major wash heading into Las Vegas. The city of Las Vegas has contended for years with flash floods, and washes are not the best sites to develop. When they arrived at the pits, they pulled off into the desert and walked to a spot where Tom indicated they should stop. Tom began surveying the area with what John assumed was a metal detector. After some searching, he found a spot where the detector came alive. He placed a rock at that point. Then he went off in another direction until the detector sounded again. Another rock was placed at the second point. Again, he repeated his search for a spot in the dark that would complete an equilateral triangle. Sure enough, the detector sounded at the exact spot. He placed a third rock. All the time, searching and setting up the triangle, Tom kept checking his watch. With all three corners of the triangle revealed, he began to feel his way to the true center of the triangle. Judging his position relative to the three points of the triangle and feeling confident he was in position, he stepped aside and placed John dead center in the triangle. Tom stepped back, staring at his watch and waited. John, he said, in just a minute you will feel a pulse through your body. The points of the triangle are places where transmission pillars have been buried deep in the earth. In the center of these transmission pillars, where you now stand, is where the transmission waves will be generated. Where they are transmitting to, I don't know. But I do know these transmissions occur at regular intervals during the late night. And when they occur, you can feel them. They're about to transmit any minute now. They both remained quiet as they waited. Suddenly, just as Tom had described, John felt a sensation in the darkness. John described a physical force like an electrical pulse, rolling up his body from his toes to his head. It was as if a group of people were surrounding you with rolling pins, and they were rolling them up your body from your toes to the top of your head. It didn't last too long, and just as suddenly as it started, it stopped. It was never made clear to John how Tom knew about these transmission events. He was only told that, for whatever reason, Tom had known about certain alien information for many years and was sworn to secrecy. With that experience under John's belt, Tom felt confident that John was prepared for what Tom felt compelled to show him. The only reason Tom gave for showing John any of this was just in case. 
Next time, took John on a drive outside of Las Vegas. They headed west on the Blue Diamond Highway leading toward Par Rock, Nevada. The town of Blue Diamond is about 15 to 20 miles southwest of Las Vegas. At some point near Blue Diamond, Tom drove off the highway and headed into the desert. Tom told him that what he was about to show him, he needed to get off his chest. He had information about aliens among us and was sworn to secrecy. He had kept these secrets for as long as he could, which John assumed was many years. At Tom's advanced age, he wanted someone else to know some of what he knew. The headlights bounced in front of their car, illuminating the dirt road that led deeper into the desert. As cacti and sagebrush rushed past them, Tom confessed that by spilling the beans, his life would be in danger. Regardless of the consequences for both of them, they drove on. Moments later, they pulled up to a door in the middle of nowhere, set into the side of a rocky bluff. This door, this location, this place, was what Tom wanted John to see. They only stayed a moment when Tom said, We have to leave right now. They know we are here. As they drove away from the mysterious door, suddenly lights appeared to them as headlights materialized virtually out of nowhere and began following them. Tom picked up speed. At several points, the lights tailed them no less than three feet off their back bumper. Jolts of anxiety, fear, and panic swept through both Tom and John. Without warning, the lights went black. Tom craned his neck to look back. No lights or vehicles were visible. Only darkness. That was the last time John would see Tom. Days after this strange experience, John saw Tom out but was unable to find him. Tom's home was empty and none of his neighbors knew where he went. None of them saw him leave. The neighbor across the street claimed to see men in white hazmat suits take all Tom's belongings. After several days not being able to move past the strange events, John decided he would revisit the transmission site. Late one evening, while driving home from work, he made a detour to the pits. As he approached, he anticipated pulling into the desert area where he and Tom had once parked. He discovered that he wouldn't be able to pull off the road due to a dirt berm having been erected. He instead parked his truck on the shoulder of the road and got out. He made his way to the berm and climbed up, instead of the dark, vacant area he had visited days before. Now before him was a lot of construction equipment and massive construction lights flooding the entire area. He climbed up the berm and, while resting on his stomach, looked over to see what all the commotion was about. No sooner had he begun looking when, suddenly, as if on cue, floodlights all around the construction site turned and pointed their beams directly at his position. Not wanting to feel paranoid, he quickly left the area and drove home. Later he learned the city had started construction on a flood retention basin and park at the site. John still couldn't shake the feelings left by this experience. Where was Tom, considering what was going on at the transmission site? Did any of it have to do with Tom? Eventually, he shared the experience with a couple of his friends. They, of course, were curious and wanted him to show them the door in the desert. After some coaxing, John agreed, and they headed out. They took his friend's vehicle, and John set shotgun. At one point, as they were driving the dirt road... John began to feel nervous and admittedly scared. He considered telling his friend to take a wrong turn, acting as though he had forgotten the directions on how to get there. He knew had he acted as if he didn't remember the location of the door, he'd take a lot of heat from his friends. Instead of deflecting, he found himself drawn closer in the direction of the door. His own curiosity had gotten the best of him. As they drove along, they saw up ahead an old pickup truck that had pulled off alongside the dirt road. As they approached, they could make out an extremely tall, thin man leaning against the driver's side door. His dress was casual, and he sported a pair of dark sunglasses. They pulled up behind the truck, and the tall man walked up to the driver's window, bent down, and asked them what they were doing out there. We're just driving around said the driver, and they all gestured in the affirmative. You need to turn around, he told them. You've driven onto private property. Who are you? They said, pushing back with a little attitude, not willing to immediately comply. I'm the law out here, he said, but he wore no uniform, nor did he flash a badge. 
The tall man offered no sign of authority. John's friends were unimpressed. The tall man straightened, paused, then slowly walked around the vehicle and lowered his head into the passenger's window where John sat. John's window was down. When he was face to face with John, he raised his sunglasses and looked directly into his eyes. What John saw in the tall man's eyes sent a shock throughout his entire body. Looking back at him were not the eyes of a man. The tall man's eyes were more feline than human, and he addressed John by his full name. John Blank, he said. Consider this your warning. Do we have an understanding? John said yes, and with that, they drove away. That is the extent of the story as told by John to my friend Doe. I don't know any more. I have lived in Las Vegas for over 50 years and have never seen a door in the desert, but they're a part of the desert around Blue Diamond that are not accessible to the public. Doe has approached John since talking to me and asked if he would be willing to take us to the door. So far, the answer is no. Not me, but my dad. He was taking a piss after field dressing a deer he just shot. From the darkness about 10, 15 feet away, a cougar screamed at him, which sounds like a woman screaming bloody murder. Seriously, YouTube a video. It's nuts. He nearly shit himself and thankfully had a pistol on him. He fired a warning shot and loaded the deer on the gator to finish at Camp LOL. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.